The early 20th century, the somatogenic and psychogenic perspectives. As the moral movement was declining in the late 1800s, two opposing perspectives emerged and began to compete for the attention of clinicians. The somatogenic perspective, the view that abnormal psychological functioning has physical causes, and the psychogenic perspective, the view that the chief causes of abnormal functioning are psychological. These perspectives came into full bloom during the 20th century. The somatogenic perspective the somatogenic perspective has at least a 2,400-year history remember Hippocrates' view that abnormal behavior resulted from brain disease and an imbalance of humors? Not until the late 19th century, however, did this perspective make a triumphant return and begin to gain wide acceptance. Two factors were responsible for this rebirth. One was the work of a distinguished German researcher, Emil Kreppelin. In 1883, Kreppelin published an influential textbook arguing that physical factors, such as fatigue, are responsible for mental dysfunction. In addition, he developed the first modern system for classifying abnormal behavior. He identified various syndromes, or clusters of symptoms, listed their physical causes, and discussed their expected course. New biological discoveries also triggered the rise of the somatogenic perspective. One of the most important discoveries was that an organic disease, syphilis, led to general paresis, an irreversible disorder with both physical and mental symptoms, including paralysis and delusions of grandeur. In 1897, the German neurologist Richard von Krafttebing injected matter from syphilis sores into patients suffering from general paresis and found that none of the patients developed symptoms of syphilis. Their immunity could have been caused only by an earlier case of syphilis. Since all of his patients with general paresis were now immune to syphilis, Krafttebing theorized that syphilis had been the cause of their general paresis. Finally, in 1905, Fritz Schaden, a German zoologist, discovered that the microorganism Treponema paulida was responsible for syphilis, which in turn caused general paresis. The work of Kreppelin and the new understanding of general paresis led many researchers and practitioners to suspect that physical factors were responsible for many mental disorders. Perhaps all of them. These theories and the possibility of quick and effective medical solutions for mental disorders were especially welcomed by those who worked in mental hospitals, where patient populations were now growing at an alarming rate. Despite the general optimism, biological approaches yielded mostly disappointing results throughout the first half of the 20th century. Although many medical treatments were developed for patients in mental hospitals during that time, most of the techniques failed to work. Physicians tried tooth extraction, tonsillectomy, hydrotherapy, alternating hot and cold baths, and lobotomy, a surgical cutting of certain nerve fibers in the brain. Even worse, biological views and claims led, in some circles, to proposals for immoral solutions such as eugenic sterilization. The elimination of individuals' ability to reproduce. Not until the 1950s, when a number of effective medications were finally discovered, did the somatogenic perspective truly begin to pay off for patients. The Psychogenic Perspective The late 19th century also saw the emergence of the psychogenic perspective, the view that the chief causes of abnormal functioning are often psychological. This view, too, had a long history, but it did not gain much of a following until studies of hypnotism demonstrated its potential. Hypnotism is a procedure in which a person is placed in a trance-like mental state during which he or she becomes extremely suggestible. It was used to help treat psychological disorders as far back as 1778, when an Austrian physician named Friedrich Anton Mesmer established a clinic in Paris. His patients suffered from hysterical disorders, mysterious bodily ailments that had no apparent physical basis. Mesmer had his patients sit in a darkened room filled with music, 
Then he appeared, dressed in a colorful costume, and touched the troubled area of each patient's body with a special rod. A surprising number of patients seemed to be helped by this treatment, called mesmerism. Their pain, numbness, or paralysis disappeared. Several scientists believed that Mesmer was inducing a trance-like state in his patients and that this state was causing their symptoms to disappear. The treatment was so controversial, however, that eventually Mesmer was banished from Paris. It was not until years after Mesmer died that many researchers had the courage to investigate his procedure, later called hypnotism, from hypnos, the Greek word for sleep, and its effects on hysterical disorders. The experiments of two physicians practicing in the city of Nancy in France, Hippolyte Marie Bernheim and Ambrose Auguste Leibault, showed that hysterical disorders could actually be induced in otherwise normal people while they were under the influence of hypnosis. That is, the physicians could make normal people experience deafness, paralysis, blindness, or numbness by means of hypnotic suggestion and they could remove these artificial symptoms by the same means. Thus they established that a mental process hypnotic suggestion could both cause and cure even a physical dysfunction. Leading scientists concluded that hysterical disorders were largely psychological in origin, and the psychogenic perspective rose in popularity. Among those who studied the effects of hypnotism on hysterical disorders was Joseph Brewer of Vienna. Brewer, a physician, discovered that his patients sometimes awoke free of hysterical symptoms after speaking candidly under hypnosis about past upsetting events. During the 1890s, Brewer was joined in his work by another Viennese physician, Sigmund Freud. As you will see in Chapter 3, Freud's work eventually led him to develop the theory of psychoanalysis, which holds that many forms of abnormal and normal psychological are psychogenic. In particular, Freud believed that unconscious psychological processes are at the root of such functioning. Freud also developed the technique of psychoanalysis, a form of discussion in which clinicians help troubled people gain insight into their unconscious psychological processes. He believed that such insight, even without hypnotic procedures, helped the patients overcome their psychological problems. Freud and his followers offered psychoanalytic treatment primarily to patients suffering from anxiety or depression, problems that did not typically require hospitalization. These patients visited therapists in their offices for sessions of approximately an hour and then went about their daily activities a format of treatment now known as outpatient therapy. By the early 20th century, psychoanalytic theory and treatment were widely accepted throughout the Western world. Current Trends It would hardly be accurate to say that we now live in a period of great enlightenment about or dependable treatment of mental disorders. In fact, surveys have found that 43% of respondents believe that people bring mental disorders on themselves. And 35% consider such disorders to be caused by sinful behavior. Nevertheless, there have been major changes over the past 50 years in the ways clinicians understand and treat abnormal functioning. There are more theories and types of treatment, more research studies, more information. And perhaps because of those increases more disagreements about abnormal functioning today than at any time in the past. In some ways the study and treatment of psychological disorders have made great strides, but in other respects clinical scientists and practitioners are still struggling to make a difference.